Hello, and welcome to Talking Precision Medicine, Data, Drugs, and AI podcast. In this series, we sit down with experts on the application of AI and big data analytics in the drug discovery space. Our guests are innovators, business decision makers, and thought leaders at the intersection of data and therapeutics. We discuss the promise, practice, and challenges and myths of AI in precision medicine. This show is brought to you by Genialis, and Rafael, our CEO, is your host. Genialis is focused on data integration and predictive modeling in precision medicine. We help accelerate the discovery and de-risk the development of novel therapeutics. From heterogeneous data and diverse information stores, we predict with confidence drug targets and biomarkers of tolerance, efficacy, and outcome. Today, we speak with Elia Stuka. Elia is the Chief Analytics Officer and Senior Vice President of the Life Sciences Business at Health Catalyst, a next-generation data analytics and decision support company. He has extensive experience leading interdisciplinary teams in academia and industry, encompassing fields such as genomics, computational biology, data science, AI, and NLP, and is a true visionary leader with a passion for innovation in health and life sciences. At Health Catalyst, Elia is leveraging companies' data to advance the life sciences, from drug discovery to understanding patient impact of specific medications. The conversation covers a lot of ground, including Elia's take on using data at the point of care, key challenges in making therapeutic innovation accessible to the population at large, and the importance of storytelling in work and in life. Let's get right into it. It's my pleasure today to be joined by Elia Stupka. Elia recently joined the team at Health Catalyst. He's got too many titles for me to remember, so I'll let him introduce himself and his roles there. Uh, so Elia, thanks for joining us on the podcast today. Um, tell us a little bit about Health Catalyst and what you're doing. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to join you on this podcast. Uh, yeah, I recently joined Health Catalyst as a Chief Analytics Officer and uh, Senior Vice President of the Life Sciences business, which is quite a mouthful. But uh, to make a long story short, we are embarking on a new adventure at Health Catalyst, where Health Catalyst has been extremely successful at building up analytics and insights and supporting uh, major hospitals across the U.S. with their data and building data warehouses. And we are sort of launching into this new adventure of using all of that data to hopefully help all the life sciences industry players, both established large pharma as well as innovative new companies uh, to leverage this data and create an ecosystem to accelerate and drive value in the development of new therapeutics and new uh, diagnostics. That's, that's very cool. So as long as I've known you, you've always been a huge advocate of data aggregation, of, of smart use of data in both uh, discovery and healthcare. Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of data that Health Catalyst capture as part of this, this value add to healthcare providers? I think the last years we've seen an emergence of you know, data-driven business models where, especially in healthcare, where data gets aggregated across multiple you know, EHR systems, hospitals, or also claims data, and it's sort of leveraged usually with the sort of keyword buzzword RWE, so real-world evidence drawn from real world data to capture sort of the life of patients at hospitals. Um, what we do at Health Catalyst is we uh, integrate this information from EHRs with many other data sources from all the different systems that the hospital runs, uh, whether it's HR, finance, billing, um, etc. So we get to see the picture of a patient across the board and also to connect sort of the more clinical research view of a patient with the more operational and financial um, view of that same patient. So I think we're, from that point of view, we're you know, uniquely positioned to look at uh, diverse data sets. Having said that, there's a lot of other data that we don't own or see. But I think what's also emerging is there are many more ways nowadays to work together across organizations, be, be they for-profit or not-for-profit, and bring data assets together across these organizations to derive better insights for patients. Do you see uh, hospitals sort of converging around a certain subset of problems that you guys are solving over and over? 
over again? Or do, does each new provider create kind of a whole new use case? Yeah, our case is a bit special in that, you know, the company is really extremely focused on outcome improvement. And so in a way, you know, in a lot of scenarios, uh, we come in and sort of help our organizations improve on outcomes. When we talk about outcomes, we mean both the reduction of cost as well as an improvement in clinical out outcomes and clinical quality. So it could be a redu reduction of mortality, readmission, you know, et cetera, but at the same time, well, uh, keeping an eye on cost. Uh, so I would say there's certainly a lot of stories that replicate across our providers. And very often it's sort of us coming in and learning about one problem space, building analytics around that problem space, and then helping multiple clients achieve that. And that's what's also interesting now looking at it from a more life science industry perspective. We can make sure that, for example, when a new farm is developing a new therapy, we can help look at whether it's really driving better outcomes, which is becoming in turn very important for payers because payers are driving much more towards a value-driven model to reimburse for drugs. Yeah, that takes me exactly where, where I was going to go with my next question, which is to think a little bit about the landscape of, of outcomes-based payers. So who's leading the charge here? Are the, the national single-payer systems, for example, in Europe? Do we see this from private insurance companies in the U.S.? Yeah, I would say there's certainly a very strong push in the U.S., uh, both from specific payers that are, you know, pushing more towards this, uh, towards this angle from Medicare itself, but also probably the, the most interesting recent wave is self-insured employers. Of course, we had, you know, the, the important announcement of Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon, et cetera, creating, you know, their own self-insured employer type system. And we'll see more of that. And one of the reasons why employers are becoming an interesting space is that to them, value is sort of aligns across the whole chain because if their employees are healthier, um, they are more productive. And so there's less of this sort of fragmentation that we had in the old days between different parts of the systems. Um, I would say certainly the U.S. is, is leading the charge in this, uh, in this area. That's interesting. And almost the opposite of what I would have guessed, just given my cynicism about, you know, the <laughs> system. I said leading the charge. I didn't say succeeding across the board. <laughs> you yeah. can still lead the charge across the cliff. Sure. <laughs> The wily e. Coyote approach to a. <laughs> you mentioned that, that Health Catalyst will provide analytics. Can you discuss a little bit the range of analytics? So, you know, nominally, this this uh, podcast is themed around sort of artificial intelligence and and some of the advanced use cases, but also buzzwords in that space. You know, what are the range of of actual analytics capabilities that a group like Health Catalyst brings? Yeah, I like your reference to buzzwords because, uh, you know, AI is probably the most inflated buzzword of, you know, of the last couple of years. I think, you know, first of all, the, the other buzzword that is often used is big data. And especially for, you know, some of us coming originally from the sort of genomics bioinformatics world, uh, you know, we tend to talk about big data. And then at the end of the day, we have 20,000 patients, 50,000 patients, you know, we measure 20,000 genes. We're still talking about tens of thousands of points. And anybody from Facebook or Netflix or Amazon would sort of laugh at, at uh, that field calling itself big data. In healthcare, actually, I would say we're pretty close to serious big data. So just, you know, starting from the data side, as an example, you know, the health catalyst, we um, literally look at, you know, 100 million patients. We look at uh, several billion medications and lab results and percent procedures, et cetera. So I think we are, you know, reasonably close to what the serious big data players of the world would uh, start considering uh, big data in terms of our size and, and, and richness of the data. When it comes to the analytics and the, and the analytics slash data science slash AI, which is, you know, many flavors of similar things, we have some interesting work that is done by bringing the data from different clients um, into one cloud-based space. And uh, this is a recent product that we call Touchstone, where we're able to build machine learning models across our clients and look at what is the expected versus observed for any feature that is relevant to outcomes. So it could be, again, readmissions, mortality, cost of care, Etc. And so I would say that's sort of really not to create a pun here, but it's this is like real world AI. Like this is on real data, driving real improvements, saving real lives, and in, in our hospitals and moving in that direction. And then there is a lot of you know other areas um, like forecasting and predictive analytics and etc. Where you know where I would say AI or machine learning enabled type approaches are are being deployed. 
That's fascinating. Um, this brings up sort of two questions and we can kind of take them in turn. One thing I'm interested about is who are actually the, the stakeholders you're engaging with on the, the hospital side. So when you guys come up with uh, associations or relationships between better outcomes and some behavior, how is that translated into action on the hospital side? So that's one question. And then we can either do that first or second. The other one, uh, I'm intrigued by the fact that you're able to do sort of meta-analyses across client data because I would assume these are very sensitive data. And while I'm sure everyone, you know, hospital A and hospital B both want one another to be good at saving patients, you know, there's a bit of territoriality around our valuable data in, in healthcare and in drug development and so forth. And so I'm, I'm interested to understand what kinds of data access challenges you all encounter. Yeah, and the two questions interlink nicely. I mean, our stakeholders are very much around, you know, the chief operating officer, chief quality officer, chief financial officer, um, and their, you know, and their teams, because we're driving, you know, looking at outcomes, looking at measures, looking at improving operations, looking at sort of the broad picture across the whole hospital and how to help them improve what they're doing. Um, and that in itself kind of brings on to the second question, which is, I think, you know, the sort of the cost versus benefit analysis is shifting towards understanding understanding that the aggregation of data across clients can only help. I mean, in a way, what we're doing is trying to bring in the next generation benchmarking. The benchmarks in the U.S. are still based on more old-fashioned sort of, uh, you know, more manual approaches. And in this way, we're really benchmarking on, you know, in a data-driven, more real-time uh, manner. And I think they see a lot of benefits. I mean, obviously, you know, we de-identify our information. So we're talking about uh, de um, data sets where the, the sensitive information, the PHI, et cetera, is removed. Um, and most of the time, you know, we're talking about aggregate information. So it's not sort of the single patient. I think if anything, you know, of course, every hospital is different every you know the, the risk aversion the early adopter type phenotype i mean every hospital is different but we've certainly seen a good uptake of this philosophy and if anything i think they see that we could become even greater business partners by you know showing others like payers and pharma etc the value of this data and bringing new potential projects and um, new collaborations for our hospitals as well. Uh, I'm intrigued in general by the, the movements around the world for like federated um, data stores. And also now there's really uh, a lot of excitement around things like AI and blockchain, you know, just to keep the sort of buzz going, um, but <laughs> AI and blockchain for doing sort of model training without actually having to kind of see the data in a way. I'll be really curious to see when those technologies mature, what kind of impact they have on, on sort of sharing information. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, what I think is uh, magical about blockchain and is not a buzzword and if done well could be a great enabler is this idea of building trust with the ultimate provider and consumer of the data, which is the patient, um, and allowing individuals to make granular choices and consent where they can say, yes, I would like to give my data for this particular study and not for this study. And just allow that freedom of saying, yeah, I'm okay for you to share my data with company A because I like them, I like their mission, and I'm not okay for you to share it with company B because I don't like them. Right? So creating that granularity of consent, I think, is, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be extremely useful. I think it will take a bit of time before the current companies that are building blockchain-based models you know, become sustainable and find their niche and, mm -hmm. uh, and realize the sort of business opportunity. But I think in terms of driving a new form of consent there, mm -hmm. um, it's definitely very interesting. Um, and the same for what you mentioned in terms of computing across data without kind of fully owning it or fully seeing uh, the, the extent of the data. The same is happening with homomorphic encryption, the ability you know, to compute on data um, without actually ever touching it. Is, you know, they're all interesting potential avenues for creating ethical marketplaces where data is used for good uh, in an ethical uh, way and respecting the choice of individuals. This idea or this notion of, of um, incentivizing patients to contribute data of various kinds has come up in previous conversations. What, what's your take on, on the right incentive structures here? How should patients be engaged and at what stage? You know, how can we do better to educate them about what actually happens to their data and the risks and rewards associated with it? Yeah, so I think it's early days and we will, all the companies that are operating in this space will have to learn by trying. So I think now I would err on the side of over communication and start 
seeing you know what are the reactions of the actual users right it will take time for these companies to have enough users to try enough projects to try enough sort of real engagements and relationships and so i think the best approach right now would be to uh, gather you know more information be more granular communicate more educate more and then you can always sort of start tuning in, tuning it down as you start learning some patterns and you say well actually all the users of this type you know they could make a general blanket you know a choice of receiving or not receiving things just like you know 20 years ago we started receiving you know email newsletters and then you know people got a bit smarter about you know how often to communicate with us as consumers interesting yeah i, I guess anything consumer facing ultimately could learn a lot from internet marketing and so forth which has evolved a lot in 20 years Oh, definitely. I think, you know, one thing is that I'm observing a lot is that the startups that are successful in the space usually were, did not start from sort of geeky, sciencey tech faces, but actually have people that emerged from media, journalism, marketing, you know, human facing sort of social sciences type founders, because it's a very different space. You're not there to develop the coolest algorithm on the data. You're there to create an engagement with a person. I almost think that's true, not only in, at, you know, closer to the point of care, and communicating with consumers, but even going back into a bit more of the, the geeky science around things like drug discovery, the sheer number of stakeholders with diverse backgrounds that are required to do this well uh, requires communication. And, and so, you know, this has been another kind of theme of our relationship over the past few years is your, your interest in storytelling. Let's talk about that a bit. Where, when, when did you become a storyteller? When did you decide that was the... <laughs> <laughs> when did you decide that was the, uh, and, and I know you just did a, a TEDx talk as well, so I, I know this is something you actually do like. Uh, wh what was the, the moment where you realized that's kind of a life skill? <laughs> that's a great question. I'm not sure that I can play, you know, put my finger on a particular time in my life where I realized this. It probably goes back to my original passion for photography because at the end of the day you know photography is a, is a medium for uh, for storytelling as well so it probably goes back quite early on in life in my sort of dual ladder passion for the arts and the, and the sciences and you know and I, I would say one of the sort of traits of Italy I guess uh, you know as a country to be brought up in and is sort of this uh, admixture of arts and sciences in our history so it probably starts uh, way way back there but uh, I do believe you know, it is absolutely crucial and it has hit uh, our projects and, you know, in my previous various roles. You know, I remember when we were in Beringer Ingelheim um, you know, Pharma, we were building out this pretty neat machine learning tools to do indication expansion, et cetera. And we realized that pretty much half of our resources had to be invested in the storytelling because there is no way to sell the machine learning results to a business owner, a business decision maker, stakeholder, uh, without it being wrapped into a story that is, you know, understandable believable, trustable, and where you can kind of poke your finger and say, well, I really want to see if this holds. Um, and you can actually see what, what drove the machine learning model. So um, I think, yeah, it's definitely been a theme. Uh, I also think rare diseases are uh, an incredibly interesting space where this is coming out uh, sort of uh, at its, probably at its maximum potential, where it's so important to leverage the patients and the doctors, um, the patients' families, the scientists. There is sort of this unique family of people who happen to have a professional private role in the space but really they're all experts right the, the the parents of a rare disease child usually are very often more knowledgeable than you know the the, the medical uh, professionals in a you know 550 to 100 mile radius so unless they go out and find that particular medical professional that has dedicated their life to that disease they feel that they know more than the local doctor and uh, the same with scientists so you find that around some rare diseases you have three doctors from three continents and you know and a bunch of scientists from four other places and 20, 30 engaged families. And they really are kind of one community that is trying to drive that, that field. And there, I think, again, storytelling becomes so much more part of how things are done because of the, of the special nature of those diseases. So you mentioned briefly you had uh, been at Bowen and Ingelheim. I'd like to dive into your, your CV a little bit. So I, I'm actually quite fascinated by your work history and training history. Obviously, the world doesn't stand still. Technologies, especially in, in life sciences and, and the genomics revolution and the cloud compute and so forth have accelerated at the blink of an eye. Tell us a little bit about your journey uh, and your the evolution of your professional training. You know, when you were in grad school, did you imagine you know X number of years from now you'd be sitting where you are today doing what you're doing? 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I wasn't even in grad school, actually, when I started uh, working on the Human Genome Project in Cambridge. Uh, I was a mere scientific programmer in this budding team led by you and Bernie at the ABI where all of a sudden we were tasked to assemble 30, 40 people and build, you know, pipelines and databases and visualization tools for the Human Genome Project. I think the leitmotif of, you know, of the past 20 years has been my uh, healthy, constant dissatisfaction uh, with the state of things in, in health. Um, so, you know, when I worked on the Human Genome Project, I felt you know, very privileged and honored to have such an amazing opportunity at such an early age. But I also felt rapidly within, you know, the following years as I moved to Singapore and worked on other large-scale genome projects with Sidney Brenner and his team, um, and then in Italy at the Teleton Institute of Genetic Medicine, I kind of felt this urge to move from this sort of abstract big data um, world to something that would have impact on patients. And, uh, and so that brought me first to become a sort of dry, wet uh, scientist, which at the time was you know, relatively uh, unusual still. Now it's, of course, much more common. But, you know, having molecular biologists and bioinformaticians working together in a team to try and identify interesting things in the genome and then figure out what they were doing, like regulatory elements and non-coding RNAs and all those things. But then that kind of dissatisfaction brought me to the next step, which is that we did a lot of very basic research and I wanted to get closer to translational uh, research. And that led me first to work at you know, UCL in London, where we set up the sort of UCL genomics together with Mike Eubank. And we were driving, this was when Illumina started becoming reasonably affordable, still expensive compared to now, but reasonably affordable for exome for rare diseases. So we moved towards like, you know, diagnosing uh, kids with um, rare diseases. And then I moved to San Rafael, where we got even closer to translation because, um, again, great privilege and honor to be supporting with the sequencing and informatics, the efforts of the gene therapy trials that were ongoing there, which then became, you know, one of the first approved um, gene therapy treatments. It was also a very unique place in that I really had sort of the ability to create a very interdisciplinary team. So we built also an ethics component where we did ethics and political philosophy and looked at all the sort of, you know, ethical and uh, philosophical issues that genomics were opening up in society, So, which was an amazing experience. And, uh, and then again, on the kind of trajectory of having more concrete impact, I realized, well, actually, you know, pharmaceutical companies is where those things become real. I mean, they become products that go onto the market and that people worldwide can use. So I wanted to learn about that process and that's how I moved to Beringer Ingelheim. And there I learned all of that side, like drug development and, and what it means to develop a drug and really bring it to success. And also how terribly optimistic we are in academia and thinking that, you know, when we discover something, it will save the world. And actually it's still such a long journey for a pharmaceutical company to turn that into a real product that survives and reaches the market. What I missed still, talking about, you know, the constant satisfaction that helps you to shape, you know, and have impact in your life, was that um, in pharma, there is still a tendency to divide data and the teams that handle data in like R&D and clinical and operational and commercial, etc. And so I felt a little bit uh, cut away from the world of patients um, and patient information. Um, and so that was what led me to move to Dana-Farber, where they were building up an informatics department that was bridging research and operations, where I could see the two sides of the coin. Extremely interesting, you know, to look at, for example, how immunotherapy is successful in a clinical trial, but then when it gets commercialized, it has actually more safety issues and, you know, and adverse events than you had seen in the trial and what does that mean and how do you solve those problems and that led naturally to to this step where you know both the size of what we're doing is you know incredible across 4,500 clinics and 400 hospitals and 100 million patients um, but also with this incredible diversity of data types that we can look at. That is quite a journey <laughs> but, but I you know every dot does connect even if they don't form a straight line it forms a constellation right? Well that's what Steve Jobs said, right? You, you, they connect backwards. Not you cannot try to connect them forward. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, gosh, I, so many more things I want to dig into. You you ended sort of on immunotherapy, so let's talk about that. I know this is one area, sort of emerging area of therapeutics that you were excited about. Can we talk about that excitement, but also perhaps any other areas, sort of cutting edge uh, pharmaceuticals or, or, or cell-based therapies that you're, you're keen on? It's, we're certainly living in incredibly exciting times. It's hard to keep up with the number of either you know, new biotechs or just new therapies coming from established pharma that are basically leveraging, I think, all the network effects that have happened over the past 20 years and you know, our understanding of the genome on the one side, CRISPR-Cas editing on the other, our understanding of the immune system, 
system uh, and our understanding of disease, right? So when you take this sort of four pillars together, we're kind of at this explosive moment where it's really impossible to uh, generate very novel therapies with sort of curative potential in many cases and, and certainly high impact in many others. Um, so I think it is exciting times. I think like all exciting times, there's going to be sort of a, you know, a second phase where it kind of boils down and it's some uh, some will emerge as clear winners versus others and you know some will start showing their weaknesses etc cetera, etc cetera. i think one of the areas that i'm particularly concerned about and interested in that i mentioned actually in my tedx that you referred to earlier is this notion that all of this innovation also drives the potential danger of who is going to benefit um, and i don't mean that purely just from the economic standpoint which is certainly an important one right like who will pay for this and who will be able to afford this but i think even if we lived in a perfect world where everybody you know had a payer paying for the most sophisticated therapies that could save their lives there's going to be some truly deep technological and i would call them so i like to call it biologistics problems in that you know you look at cancer vaccines or you look at car t you know you need a designated center you need a pretty sophisticated place to be able to deliver this type of therapy and that's here in the us and it's still limited to you know a few sophisticated designated centers imagine when you're talking globally i think there'll be you know in my mind one of the questions of the next sort of five, 10 years, not whether we are able to prevent or cure a lot of diseases, but how rapidly and efficiently will we deliver all this incredible innovation out into the world? You know, how will we create a sort of push rather than a pull, you know, where you, you know, the patient doesn't need to understand any of this, their local doctor doesn't need to understand any of this, but there'll be systems in place to say, hey, you know, you've been just been diagnosed with X, Y, Z of subtype one, two, three, four, seven, and here is a match for you for either a clinical trial or for a tailored therapeutic journey based on all the greatest innovations in the world. So I think that's going to be a very important team, right? It's um, it's not whether this all these things will work because I think there'll be a lot of great therapies that will work, but it's how we will build systems that will allow people to know about it, to leverage it, to, you know, bureaucratically, technically, and financially be able to actually pull the trigger and be able to access that. I guess for a lot of these therapies, we're quite a ways away from having a stable oral pill that you can ship to somewhere. And Yeah, some of them, I think, you know, some of them will never be a pill. Yeah, of right? course. They, they start from your own cells, right? <laughs> so they will never be a pill. I think the only way they could become pill-like is with, you know, robotics and nanotechnology, et cetera, right? So it would be still a, you know, CAR-T mm -hmm. therapy, but there would be some magic little yeah. device that would do all of it at your, you know, local clinic or something. Yeah. I, I'm reminded of a, a talk I saw by another great Italian drug discoverer, Mauro Ferrari, at Meth you know, at a Methodist in Houston, where he said his view as a sort of nanoscientist engineer before he was a a medical practitioner. Drugs is essentially a delivery problem, and that was has been his take. And now we're talking about not only how does it get to where it needs to go in the body, but how does it even reach the patient? How does the patient yeah. reach? To what extent do you think discrepancies like the one you mentioned between the clinical trial efficacy of, say, an immune therapy and the real-world efficacy or the patient population efficacy is due to the wrong kind of patient representation or just we need a bigger N? You know, so are we seeing the kind of diversity we need to see in both you know, discovery efforts but also clinical efforts to, to make these therapies universal? Let's start from the premise that the, the problem is a generic one, right? The clinical trials are smaller population sizes, more selected patients, more selected sites, etc. So the, there is a fundamental general well-known problem when you move from clinical trial to, to real world, right? And that's why we need much more real world driven evidence in the future for, for drug development. Specifically to immunotherapy, you know, I think it's all so new that we uh, have very little in terms of a hunch as to why, uh, you know, some of these events are being observed and everybody's sort of starting to try to, to work on them. And I think the more we can generate sort of um, common collectives, consortia, collaboration where different companies come together and say, hey, let's try to face this problem transparently and figure out what's happening. So far, you know, we're really scratching the surface and we were, you know, even at Dana-Farber, we're at the stage of like, let's look at the clinical notes. Let's look, you know, use NLP and AI and see, you know, is there any anything interesting that we can pick up there? So I think there's still uh, really a lot to be learned. 
you mentioned the word diversity. Uh, you know, I think that's another thing that we should not you know, hide away from, which is, no, we don't have enough diversity. There is a bias, you know, a bias in everything that we do in big data and healthcare. Uh, there is a bias, a socioeconomic bias, a racial bias, a language bias. You know, I'm always struck by whatever data set you take in health, it's not going to be anywhere close to representative of the general population in the U.S. And this has more and more real implications. If the cancer panel data that you are, you know, informing from in order to make a diagnostic decision is extremely imbalanced towards, you know, richer, maler, if that is even a word, <laughs> whiter uh, people, it actually means you're going to diagnose less of the other people, right? And so that's a, a real issue that we have to start tackling. And I think, you know, projects like all of us that are trying to, you know, reach a million people, but keep that sort of representation of the U.S. population uh, will hopefully help in this direction. Yeah, a lot of work's to be done, but I think just being cognizant of the the challenge is a good step. Um, let's take a, a bit of a detour. So I, I enjoyed kind of the trip down memory lane of your career, but one one aspect of your interests and activities that we didn't talk about at all is your mentorship with startups and and general interest in in kind of business and and business development. Talk a little bit about your experiences at MIT and and at various incubators and actually mentoring startup. And full disclosure, Alia has been a mentor to Genialis and is actually on the board of directors of Genialis. Alice um, for the past year. It, it all started pretty much from uh, working in pharma. You know, when I worked in pharma, a lot of our work at the time was kind of opening up to external innovation and realizing what an important role it plays in the growth of a company to work with smaller companies, to work with academic labs, and to basically let innovation seep into everything that we did. And that brought me to work with interesting companies around the world in the you know East Coast and Silicon Valley, Japan, etc. And also to learn about this world, you know, to learn about how important it is to create this sort of safe heavens uh, where you know innovators can play around with an idea whether it will succeed or fail but they're kind of you know not uh, inundated with bureaucracy of cor large corporations and can try and play with an experiment so it sort of became a natural step to start learning more about successes and failures of startups and hopefully how I could you know contribute some of our you know my experience Experiences across these different sort of landscapes and different industries. Frankly, a ton of it was learning by doing. You know, a ton of it was realizing that you know it's a problem like any other, and you need to optimize it. You need to understand what the variables are and how human behavior affects it. But it's been a great, uh, you know, a great experience. I'm very, you know, happy so far that you know the different startups that I've been involved in and foundations are all, you know, thriving and have closed, you know, one or two rounds of funding and are, you know, having impacts. The the leitmotif has been working with companies that strive to have an impact um, and, and not really just not really just looking at you know the, the profitability but uh, hopefully bringing together the you know the business model uh, with the impact that we can have on on society generally speaking i found that i guess quite well known and typical caveat is a lot of founders start from you know, one angle, right? And then they need to understand what are all the other angles, all the other skills, and you know, what are the other expertise areas that they're missing. And I find the most successful entrepreneurs that I've worked with are the ones that basically obsess about their weaknesses as a company and about their gaps and about their lack of knowledge. And it's really interesting how the ones that undersell themselves the most tend to be so successful because they're always worrying about what is it that they don't understand and don't know. So um, yeah, so it's been really um, a lot of fun working with them and helping them to grow. Well, Leah, thank you. And, and certainly, I, I think from this conversation alone, people can understand why I enjoy uh, expressing my vulnerabilities to you because you understand a lot of the angles I don't. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, thanks again for joining us and thank you all for tuning in and listening today. Thank you, have a great day. This was the third episode of Talking Precision Medicine, Data, Drugs and AI. Please share it with your colleagues, leave a comment or review and stay tuned for the next one. Thanks for joining the conversation.